In the last video, we saw some of the evidence supporting the two-source hypothesis, which posits a hypothetical document known as Q. We also saw that far from being conjured up ad hoc, Q is a conclusion drawn from careful examination of the Synoptic Gospels. It should be stated that although Q is often dated to around 40 or 50 CE, this dating is largely speculative. The best that can be said is that it obviously predates Matthew and Luke, and probably predates Mark as well, though by how much is uncertain. Now we will turn to consider the nature of the Q document, with emphasis on its content, its authorship, and its fate. As mentioned in the previous episode, it is noted that Matthew and Luke share material that is not found in Mark. Most estimates identify somewhere around 235 verses from Matthew and Luke that comprise Q. However, as could be expected, there is disagreement over certain inclusions, arguments favoring the inclusion of additional verses, and debate over how to reconstruct specific passages. There are instances of overlap between Mark and Q where it seems that Matthew or Luke merge the two readings to create something new. There are also cases where a portion of Q may have only been preserved in one gospel. These are quite difficult issues to address, well beyond the scope of this video, so I will try to confine my citations of Q to the content agreed upon by the majority of experts, particularly those at the International Q Project. Practically any book on Q will include a reconstruction as an appendix, and I would recommend the short but highly informative book, Q the Earliest Gospel, by John Kloppenborg. The first thing we notice when looking at these 235 verses is the overwhelming majority of them are sayings attributed to Jesus. Like the Analects of Confucius or the Anecdotes of the Cynics, Q presents the sayings of Jesus as either simple statements or a response to an inquiring figure. In both cases, the focus is on some wisdom imparted by the teacher or master. Thus, there is a bit of narrative material to Q, such as miracle stories, and yet the primary use of this material is to underscore words of wisdom delivered by Jesus at the close of the event. Thus, Q is not simply a mass of select quotations, but does appear to have its own structure and even its own theology, which I will comment on in a moment. It is widely accepted by proponents of Q that Luke's Gospel best preserves the original contents of the saying source. One reason for thinking this is that we know Matthew's author moved around sections of Mark more than Luke's author did, and we also find that Matthew combined different sources in his writing. Thus Luke preserves Mark quite well, generally speaking, and since it's unlikely the author drastically changed his style of source usage for another document, it's safe to assume Luke also preserves Q reasonably well. An additional reason might be because Luke locates most of the Q sayings in two sections of the Gospel, 6.20 through 8.3 and 9.51 through 18.14. By opening up two windows in the text for interpolating Q, it seems that Luke preserves the order of the sayings. Because of the arguments in favor of Luke and preservation, it's become common for scholars to refer to Luke's reading of Q material when they cite a passage in Q, i.e. Q 6.31 is Luke 6.31. I will also adopt this practice when I cite Q in this video. What may we ascertain about Q from a study of its sayings? Something very striking is that Q contains no material relating to the doctrine of salvation or the resurrection. Crucifixion is never mentioned either, but may be alluded to in Q 1427, where Jesus encourages his followers to take up their cross and follow him. In this context, this verse only indicates that part of being a disciple of Jesus means owning one's burden or owning one's faith. The motif on the noble death might also be emphasized here. Q shows little to no concern for the death of Jesus because it probably has a different theology from that of the synoptics. The presence of the kingdom of God is the message at the heart and center of Q. Practically everything Jesus says relates back to it in some way or another. Precisely what this kingdom is going to be is not as clear. A number of scholars associate it with apocalypticism. However, it's important to point out that the concept of an apocalypse does not necessarily refer to the end of the world and final judgment before God, but simply means a revelation of some hidden thing. In this sense, Q's Jesus reveals the coming or arrival of the kingdom of God. To elaborate on this, we need to understand how prophets were conceived of during the Second Temple period. In Jeremiah, Nehemiah, and other later books of the Hebrew canon, as well as Second Temple Hebrew literature in general, we find Israelite history portrayed as cycles of sinfulness, calls to repentance, divine punishment, and repeated calls to repentance along with warnings of judgment. Naturally, rejection of the prophets is frequently found throughout this theology, known as Deuteronomistic theology, 
but there is also the recurring charge of Israel killing the prophets sent by God. Nehemiah 9, 26-27 provides an example. Q shows signs of adhering to Deuteronomistic theology in two remarks about how Israel killed the prophets, and in noting how Jesus was rejected by the generation he called to repentance. It seems the author of Q interpreted Jesus' death as a necessary consequence of his message and identity as a prophet, and this is backed up by the allusion to crucifixion in Q 14.27. Just as Jesus accepted his fate, so too should anyone who takes up the burden of preaching the reign of God be prepared to meet their fate. Is it possible to figure out who wrote Q? First, one thing should be obvious, and that is that Q was written by a scribe of some sort. Greek was the language of the scribes, and as there is no evidence of Q being originally written in another language, it is reasonable to suppose the author of Q was a scribe. Another indication of this is the Lord's Prayer, which resembles administrative petitions composed by scribes on behalf of the illiterate, often requesting things such as debt relief. Finally, with a vast majority of the public untrained in writing, the likelihood of a scribe being responsible for any Greek text of the period is very high. The second thing we might be able to say is that the author was probably situated in or near Galilee. Although there are major cities mentioned in Q, like Jerusalem, Tyre, and Sidon, these cities are expected to reject the message of Jesus, and they are mainly referenced in passing. The regions Q places Jesus in are predominantly Galilean, such as Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Nazareth. Contrast this to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke with their numerous scenes set in the city, and we find Q's world to be much more rural by comparison. Q also contains none of the overturnings of the Sabbath law, the food law, or the circumcision law, as we find in the later Gospels. Thus, Q's author may well have been a Jewish scribe living in the Galilean countryside. So what happened to Q? In all honesty, this is a question we will probably never know the answer to. In fact, a number of Christian documents have not survived, with little explanation as to why. The letters of Paul discuss several additional letters that we do not have, and the writings of the early church fathers are littered with references to long-gone texts like the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Gospel of the Ebionites, and so on. Although it is tempting to assume that Q simply fell out of use after being incorporated into Matthew and Luke, there are many other equally plausible explanations, such as the document not being adopted by any early Jesus community, not being stored in the more hospitable climate of Egypt, or perishing during the Jewish-Roman War. Nonetheless, the case for Q has been strengthened since its initial proposal. The discovery of the Gospel of Thomas proved that Sang's collections were, in fact, part of the circulation of Christian material in the early centuries. What I have noted about the theology and locale of Q are things we would expect to find in a very early Christian text, before Greek and Pauline influences began to take over. If one doubts the existence of Q, he still has to explain the presence of these striking themes in the double tradition of Matthew and Luke. Of course, you could postulate that we are simply missing parts of Q that tell a bigger story, but since Matthew and Luke used all but 31 of Mark's 666 verses, it's debatable that Q would have extended much beyond the material preserved in Matthew and Luke. There is a very interesting relationship between Q, Thomas, and the Epistle of James. All three of these Christian texts are silent on salvation and resurrection, and present a more Jewish message. When I was a believer, I considered Thomas to be a second-century Gnostic work, yet the more I read, the more my reasons for drawing this conclusion were challenged and undermined. Thomas is a collection of 114 sayings of Jesus, which can be found in most scholarly books written on the subject, but there is also a fine free translation at sacredtext.com. The Gospel of Thomas is typically claimed as a Gnostic work because of a couple sayings, as well as the lack of apocalypticism. Bart Ehrman takes this latter approach in one of his books, arguing that because Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet, in his view, the absence of apocalyptic sayings from Thomas suggests a later date of composition. However, this argument may actually be inverted to support an early date. John Kloppenborg and Burton Mack have both proposed that Q was developed in several stages, the first stage consisting of wisdom sayings, the second consisting of apocalyptic motifs, and the third consisting of a refocusing on patience and a more distant time frame for the coming kingdom of God. The third stage is also where Q's temptation of Jesus is often placed. If this theory is correct, then the absence of apocalypticism from Thomas could actually support an earlier dating. 
Kloppenborg notes that nearly one-third of Thomas has parallels to Q, yet these parallels cannot be traced to interdependence of one on the other. In other words, it seems likely that each derives from a third still earlier source. I find this argument for the earliness of Thomas less compelling than some of the others, but it's worth producing as a rebuttal to Ehrman's position. Thomas is frequently dated later, especially by apologists, on the basis of sayings that seem Gnostic. For example, saying three reads, The kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Gnosis is a Greek word meaning knowledge, and we can see how people tie this in with Thomas saying three. Gnosticism teaches that we all have a spark of the divine within us, and through the revelation of a teacher like Jesus, we come to reconnect ourselves with the divine. But is this really what the passage in Thomas is telling us? Q1721 provides a remote parallel, where we are told that the kingdom of God is within. This saying in Thomas only builds on this concept, I would argue, informing believers that because the reign of God must be internal, you must know yourself to understand how you are or are not living out God's rule in your own life. There is nothing identifiably Gnostic here, and I think we can be in danger of over-Gnosticizing texts that are vague or puzzling in their language. Admittedly, there are some very puzzling sayings in the Gospel of Thomas. On the day when you were one, you became two, but when you become two, what will you do? Every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. While no immediate and satisfactory explanation may be given for these sayings, it is not enough to simply contrast them to the Gnostic teachings and declare the text a Gnostic one. Elaine Pagels did a spectacular job of showing how Gnostics would have read the writings of Paul in her book The Gnostic Paul. And yet, who would argue that Paul's writings were Gnostic because of these possible interpretations? Some scholars have suggested that saying 114 is a mistranslation, while Helmut Kester associates it with putting on the ideal of the ascetic man, which seemed to be just as likely as the Gnostic reading. There is quite an intriguing relationship between Thomas and John's Gospel as well. Both texts speak of the light within, that being Jesus, and emphasize the logos, or word, of Jesus. John's Gospel is also the only one to give the story of Doubting Thomas, which scholars like Pagels have suggested as an example of one school of thought criticizing another. The Johannine community that composed John's Gospel, which we will look more at in episode 5, was possibly familiar with the Thomasian community's work, and so included this denigration of their central figure, Thomas, who was forced to see the resurrected body of Jesus. You will recall that the Gospel of Thomas has no account of Christ's resurrection. One of the most persuasive arguments for an early dating of Thomas is that, as Stephen J. Patterson states, the sayings collection seems to have declined in importance after the emergence of the more biographical and dialogical forms near the end of the first century. It's not difficult to imagine why a collection of sayings with little narrative structure would eventually lose out to a dramatic piece of literature like the Kerygma or Gospel. Social psychologists Melanie Green and Philip Mazico conducted a study in 2011 determining that many people find a persuasive and engaging narrative to be more preferable than logic or bare facts. It helps us to visualize a bigger picture. In the case of Christianity, it may have played a fundamental role in its success. I will end this episode on one final note that is all too often overlooked when people discuss the Gospels. These writings, like Q, Thomas, Mark, etc., were not books as we think of them today. They were performance scripts. In a largely illiterate world, the Gospels would have been performed before an audience rather than read by individuals in private. This could account for the trend of Christian authors reworking previous texts into a grander story, as Matthew and Luke did with Q and Mark. In a sense, oral tradition and written documents are not as separate in Christian history as we might like to think. The Gospels were performed orally, and since we don't have the originals, we have no idea of how many drafts were composed, but it is very likely that the Gospels, while incorporating oral traditions, also created their own oral traditions, which in turn influenced the way they were scripted or read. When we ask ourselves why the Gospels have stood the test of time for nearly 2,000 years now, one compelling answer may be that they were interactive. The authors, as well as the performers, would certainly have put a great deal of thought into their work, and would have noted the reactions of the crowd, too. This kind of social interaction often tends to produce long-standing and interesting results, 
just as the work of Shakespeare went through multiple drafts, performance reviews, and other revisions to achieve the brilliant status it still enjoys today. In the next episode, we will get our first glimpse of how Sang's Gospels were transformed into narrative Gospels that would transform the face of Christianity itself.